I know, I mean, no, my God, nearly 20 years. I'm a big fan of yours, as you know, for, uh, besides being a friend for many years. Oh my God, I sound old. You know, I think my whole childhood was about in cultural encounter. Yeah. And um, I had, I can honestly say, many questions about my identity as I was growing up. It's like a cultural dialogue. My father said, well, that's your chosen destiny. So from now on, you have to live in your 800 pounds a month. No subsidized. No subsidies. Uh, and so he watched me over a few years as I became independent. Paris, this is Pearl Lamb Podcast. Today, what a pleasure that I have Dr. Armin Java with me. I've known, I've known Armin, no, my God, nearly 20 years. Oh my God, I sound old, old. And I'm such, so, so happy that Armin is now sitting here. Bye. First of all, it's a pleasure to be here and a real honor uh, to be doing this podcast with you, which, you know, I'm a big fan of yours, as you know, for, uh, besides being a friend for many years. But um, yes, I'm presently director of the Althani Collection, which is um, a private holding of works of art, more than 5,000 in quantity, that uh, starts with Neolithic art and goes down to contemporary art, uh, with a museum space in Paris, uh, in the Place de la Concorde, no less, so really in the heart of the French cultural world. Uh, but my origins are really very different from that. I was born into a business family, uh, an Indian business family in, in Africa that's been there for a few generations in a very small town, Kigali, uh, Kigali. which is the capital of Rwanda. And so um, I'm, I work in the art world, in the academic art world, let's say, in spite of my background. Okay, so let's start, dear Amin. Uh, first, you are one of the most popular director, museum well, director, all I and mean, everybody knows you, and, and you're special. Um, as a very special person, you're born in Africa. So how does art come along? I mean, I went to Africa, that, I mean, Rwanda, where is, are there mu museums there now? Well, of course, there was no museum and no library <laughs> and um, no great historic monuments. But um, I think in many ways, although it was a challenge when I was growing up, this gap or this uh, absence uh, made me more curious. And... Um, I grew up with many cultural influences because my family is from Kutch, Gujarat, from Western India, but we've been many generations in Africa. So we had an Indian-African heritage. Mm. Rwanda was part of the Belgian Congo. My mother's from Kenya, which was part of the British mm. Empire. So I had a Francophone element from my father's family. I had a very English element from my mother's family. And I grew up in the 70s and the 80s when the world was very much dominated by America, culturally. Yes, of course. And I was very lucky to, to, to travel a lot. My father was a gypsy in spirit, like me. I've inherited that. And so we had lots of travels since we were small children. And my mother would always take me to the museum. Oh. And so a lot of my art formation started uh, here in Paris, because when I was six, I went to the Louvre for the first time. It was six the, years old going to Louvre. It was the first museum I went to. And my mother bought me a camera. It was my first camera before we went into the museum. So I can still remember now the things that I saw on that first visit because they're captured. Of course, the raft of the Medusa, the mm. coronation of Napoleon, the winged victory, all of the classics of the Louvre and a high, high percentage of black uh, basalt Egyptian sculpture. I don't know why this fascinated me. Little boys love ancient Egypt, yeah. as you know. And um, that was the beginning of a whole... Six years old, six years old, you were completely enticed I was, by this. I, I mean, was captivated by the idea of public art because I think I came from a place that had no public art. And um, after that, whenever we had holidays, um, my mother would take me to the museum and she would always buy me the catalogue. Because many children, if, they ask, if they're forced to go to a museum, they stamp their feet, they didn't <laughs> want to go, they pull on the face, and you wanted to go. 
Well, you know, I was uh, I was the opposite. Should visit. I, I, I didn't test it. I didn't want to go to the football match or eat the ice cream, but I wanted to go to the museum when I was small, and um, so I was lucky to go to the British Museum, to the Viennese, to the Prado, to the Doge's Palace, to but the Bargello, all of these museums when I was a small boy. Well, and but visiting hobby is one thing. Okay, you are from an F I mean from an Indian family. Business is very <laughs> important, especially, I mean, you just told me you're the only son. Your father would have loved you to inherit and and build the legacy. What happened if you, I mean, when you told your father you want to study art well, it was, and art history? Well, it was, um, I knew when I was quite young, by the time I was 11 or 12, I knew that I could never be a businessman. You know, I, I didn't have the interest. I didn't have the instincts. Uh and when I went to university, nevertheless, I studied economics. I started. And in the, in the first semester break, my mother came to visit me. And we were having lunch. And I said to her, you know, I really would like to study history of art. That's where my passion is. And my mother, who was a very sympathetic lady, said, you know, your father's in Africa. He's so far away. How does he know what you're doing over here? <laughs> if you just study history of art, and when you're finished, you tell him that you did a history of art degree. And you know, he he'll do? have to what accept it. What could he do? And uh, that's exactly what I did. Uh, uh, and but I, excuse me, it's not a bachelor degree. You did PhD, yeah? and how? And how did you manage to persuade your father? Well, he's a sympathetic man. He was a very sympathetic man. He understood that was where my passion was. He was very encouraged by my mother, and um, he did a he did the typical thing. Once my degree was completed, once my PhD was completed, he thought I would come back and work with him in Africa. Yeah. And at that point, I said to him that I had a job in the Victoria and Albert Museum as a young curator. Uh, I can tell you it was a salary of £12,000 a year. It was £800 a month after yeah, taxes. Peanuts. So my father said, well, that's your chosen destiny. So from now on, you have to live in your £800 a month. No subsidized. No subsidies. Uh, and so he watched me over a few years as I became independent. And I think, actually, it was once that uh, my exhibitions and books started to be featured in the FT because he was a regular reader of the mm -hmm. FT, that he began to realize that I was doing something that was important. And uh, then he reconciled himself to me wow. and to my choices. But it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. And, and was he proud enough to tell his friends, as usually, it, my son is very special, doesn't he? Look at him. I think, you know, it was a classic father-son case, and it's not only in an Indian family or not only in the art world, mm. where the father sometimes doesn't tell directly the son how proud he yeah, is. Yeah, but, uh, but he started telling but his I friends, But I knew that he was right? talking to his friends, particularly when I had books, and I was yeah. sending him every time I produced a book. Um, he would, uh, he was not a reader. He would look at it. Uh, my mother is a reader, so she yeah. would read the book. Uh, but yes, of, of course, he would show it off to his friends. And, I love um, it. But, but I think since you were studying in England and America, so you must have started to be curious about or, or, or looking into or researching how Europe see Asia and how Asia see and see Europe. I see you as a bridge. You know, I think my whole childhood was about in cultural encounter. Yeah. And um, I had, I can honestly say, many questions about my identity as I was growing up. Mm. I think my parents and grandparents came for a generation where everything was oriented towards the West without any, course, qu without any questions. I came from a generation where I found my family was so Westernized that I was interested in India and I was interested in my roots. And when I went to India, finally, I felt... Oh, a when, at what age did you go I to I was 23 India? the first time. So your parents never went to India at all they during would, the 23 years? They would go for holidays sometimes themselves. They never bought you? No, they never took us. Mm -hmm. And what was very interesting is their approach to India, because although they're ethnically Indian, although they spoke yeah. the languages, uh, they didn't feel India was their home. For me, uh, from a young age, I had a big attraction to India. I had also a big attraction to the West. And... My doctoral thesis was about a subject yeah. that's really relevant to the, the post-colonial to, to all of furniture, us, the Indian furniture. which is the question of how Indians or how Asiatic people, who traditionally sat on the textiles on the India, ground, yeah. begin to use chairs. Yes. And uh, the status symbol of Western furniture 
and what it begins to mean in terms of architecture and lifestyle. Because in the traditional Indian interior, there was no division for a dining room or living room. Everything was divided according to gender. Masculine oh, so, space, feminine so space. It's like a Muslim, exactly. it's like an Islamic. But even in Hindu households, you had yeah. a division between the masculine and yeah, the feminine. Yeah. And the fact is there was very little fixed furniture. The idea is that you lived mainly on textiles on the ground and that the little furnishings you had were moved around according to the climate and according to the season. With the arrival of Europeans, we begin to see Indian elites and then it begins to trickle down using Western chairs. But can you imagine if you've spent all, your, all of your life cross-legged on the ground, yes. all of a sudden to have your feet dangling over changes your posture. posture. And then, of course, you need a table to eat or to write. And it, this, these changes lead to a complete transformation in the way Indians live. It's a transformation in body culture. And while I wrote on, on the furniture aspect of this change, many writers have addressed the question of, of fashion, clothes, um, uh, you know, the genders mixing, all of these changes happening as a result of the European presence in South Asia. So the result was a thesis all on the subject, not just of how Indians started to westernize, but also how Westerners in India started to Indianize. Yes, yes. Because we have a... Yes, when I was, I mean, I think one of the books I was reading is about the Westerners, the Europeans, especially French and British, they were coming in and, and in India. The Senate, I mean, they are, they don't bath, they don't, they have this, San sanitary was really a big problem. When they arrive in India, they learn. They learn how to clean themselves. They have a... Well, it's this, the whole subject of this question of perception yeah. um, was the basis of an exhibition I did with my colleague Anna Jackson called Encounters, the Meeting of Asia and Europe. And in this exhibition, for example, we show Japanese, Chinese and Indian uh, paintings, miniatures, etc. of Westerners. And you see how Asiatic people regarded them. And in Japan, in particular, the scent of European was a very, um, let's say, notable aspect of the yeah. European presence. So in Japanese woodblock prints, where you see an erotic print, where you see a European mm. making love, often you have incense burning in the corner to mask the scent of the European. Or he's often shown, you know, with long fingernails or a little bit unclean, a little bit unwashed. Of course, throughout... Uh, Japan, you have such a rich culture of bathing. Yes. Uh, yes. That contrasted with the European culture of, of bathing. Of course, South Asia and the Islamic world, because of the culture of uh, both Hinduism and Islam, there's constant ablutions. Yeah. You're constantly washing yourself. But this relates to many things. It relates to climate as well. It relates to textiles. The fact is that in South Asia, you had, from an early age, sophisticated culture of cotton, Mm. which could be washed and dried easily, whereas in Europe you very were heavy. relying on wool yeah, and linen. Yeah, very and, heavy. You know. So all of these big shifts and these big movements that result as a, that, that are the result of the meeting of people and the exchange of goods from a young age fascinated me. I mean, what a pity you missed that, that exhibition that you created. Encounters. I'll give you the catalog. Yeah, please, please, please. So continue. You were saying that... So I became very fascinated by this question of uh, transformation as a result of meeting of civilizations. And, you know, we can speak of many transformations, a culinary one, for example, yeah, with culinary. the Spanish and Portuguese discoveries of parts of the world. We have the tomato coming to Europe. We cannot imagine Italian food without the tomato. Yes. But it arrives quite late. Or Indian food without the green chili. But that's also brought by the Portuguese to India. Mm. It's not indigenous. Whether it's through botany and seeds, whether it's through textiles, whether it's through um, trade goods that change the way we live. All of these aspects really fascinated me as a, as a young curator. And at the VNA, I grabbed a whole of this question of furniture because for me, this Anglo-Indian furniture was a reflection of myself. I remember when I first saw a piece, it was an ivory chair based on a Robert Adam design, so late 18th century, in the V&A Museum. And when I went to see the head of the furniture department to ask about the chair, he said to me, well, it's an Indian chair, we don't know anything about it. And when I went to the head of the Indian department, uh, Debbie Swallow, she said to me, well, it's made in India, but it's a chair, it's not an Indian thing, it's Western. So this object was 
lost oh in translation. Completely it, lost in translation. Yes, you can say it belonged to neither East nor West. At the same time, it's the product of the meeting of East and West. So when I was 21 and 22 and 23 and, you know, quite lost in the world, I felt that these objects were like a reflection of myself because I was the product of these different cultures, but I was not wholly in one culture, you know. And uh, it was as a result of this research that I started to go to India. And in a way, I began to find myself and find my identity. And uh, Wow, it's only at the age of 23 you start going to, and to, and to India. India. So it must be fascinating. Well, it was interesting because it was the first time in my life that I was in an environment where I was the same color as everyone yeah. around me. So wow. I could disappear, you know. Before <laughs> that, I could, I could never disappear. And it was also the first time in my life where I heard uh, the languages we speak at home, Kachi and Gujarati, heard all around me in shops, in restaurants, etc. So I knew that I was at home. How So amazing. this was, a, a, you know, a moment of big recognition. But the theme of encounter is something that's marked my entire academic and curatorial career. So, you know, after the furniture, I became interested in uh, China, Japan, India, and the West. And and um, Edward Said's book Orientalism. Yes. And so Anna Jackson and I did this exhibition called Encounters, which tried to show how different Asiatic people looked at the West. So you know we think a lot about chinoiserie. We think a lot I about. I love chinoiserie. We all love chinoiserie. I love. But we have to remember that at the same time, in India and in China, there was a similar fascination for the buildings of the of the West. The summer, of course. summer palace complex is the Baroque um, pleasure garden. Um, um, not this, uh, the old summer palace, the, the one, one. Be, the one being burned down, completely Baroque. Yes. Uh, well, we can only see uh, some drawings, painting. Can you imagine if it is, I mean, if it would have survived? But it was fascinating. It's fascinating. What's interesting, though, is that, of course, the Yongzheng Emperor and the Qianlong Emperor yeah. were fascinated by European painting techniques and perspective, by European astronomy, of by course. glass making. Um, by many European technologies, whether it was lenses Clock. or mirrors or clocks, clocks, the fascination for clocks. And what this exhibition tried to do is to break down some of the cultural stereotypes we have, because we're always raised to think that uh, China has never been interested in the West. Oh, no, but not you at see, all. The Qianlong Chen exactly. was the height. It was the height of Western. It was the height, yeah. And absorbing Western technologies, such as glass technology, yeah, the to Beijing produce glass. objects that are very mm. Chinese. So this exhibition dealt with this whole question, um, not just trade goods and luxury goods, but we also looked at religion. We looked at the transformation of Japan with Christianity. We looked at Christian art at the Mughal court, for example. Um, and then after that, I became fascinated by a subject that, that uh, really marked my work for 10 or 15 years, which is um, Indian princes. Mm. And the fact that Indian princes over time become more and more westernized, and although they maintain the same spectacle and the same parade, over time, they, do, they express their power through Western goods. So the elephant is replaced by Rolls Royce. Uh, the traditional jewelry is replaced by Cartier and yeah, Duchamp. Yeah. Uh, all of the regalia is changed and Westernized. The throne chair, instead of sitting on the floor, they're sitting on a chair, chair. made of silver. But this whole question of um, production of luxury in the West for consumption in the East is something that fascinated me because when I was growing up, we had such a strong obsession with the superiority of anything from the West. I can understand. You know, absolutely, absolutely. It was just I the mean, way it was. I mean, and even China, when it first opened, uh, what they want is they want to be America. Exactly. So the roads are big, big supermarket. Everything is big, big, big. Yes, everything Same is thing. big and Western. And, yeah, Western, yeah. And um, so I grew up with that mentality. I didn't always accept it, but I grew up with yeah. it. And the Maharajas and the Indian princes of the late 19th and 20th century give up gradually their traditional palaces with floor-based living, and they create Western-style palaces. So even if superficial, and Even if superficially they look Indian, in fact, in... in technology and structure they're completely western they have a billiard room they have a swimming pool they have all the western elite objects all the western elite functions and um, this became the basis of a book that i did called made for maharajas uh, which became uh, you know translated in all the languages 
and it's thanks to that book that I, I had a really lucky meeting with a great collector, which is uh, His Highness Sheikh Hamad bin Abdullah Al Thani. Mm-hmm. We met took, in Voltaire a few yeah, weeks ago. Voltaire, uh, Voltaire, and Turkey. In Turkey, and then we yes. did the, with all your girlfriends, yes. and then we did that great trip together in uh, Baku. Yeah, Baku is. Yes. My God, Baku is another world. That's more than 10 years ago. Yeah, that was 2000... You were still a Christie's boy. 11, I was yeah. a Christie's boy. <laughs> Your life is, com- I mean, completely like a paradox. Academic. All of a sudden, you are in the most extreme. Not even a gallery, but an auction house. You have to sell. A director of Asian art. art. How did, I mean, did you enjoy it? Yes, in the beginning, I really loved Christie's. I had a great time. Uh, you know, what happened to me is um, I always liked, at the same time as working hard, I always liked people, and I always liked to go I, out. Mm-hmm. And so when I started to produce books at the V&A Museum, I wanted to make sure they were very serious books because I wanted people to understand that I could go out at the same time as mm-hmm. produce. Uh, and after a few years of doing that I, and doing exhibitions, I wanted to change. And I was very lucky after launching Made for Maharajas that... I was offered, like that, uh, a job with one of the auction houses. And uh, in the beginning, I was very reluctant, but very quickly I began to realize uh, that this could be an exciting new chapter. And they pay much, much higher, better. (laughs) But aside from that, it was the moment at which um, every week in the newspapers, it was was about India opening up to the world, the new Indian Mm. billionaires, the new Indian museums that were going to happen then. And so the auction houses looked at someone like me and thought, you know, I mean, is the right person to help us open this market? And for me, I was also very gung ho and very, very, you know, full of beans, as you say, and full of beans to do things. Yeah, you're excited. I was excited. And it was great fun because all of a sudden I was, uh, you know, flying London, Hong Kong, uh, Kuala Lumpur, LA, Dubai, Baku, oh, you know, leading yeah, this yeah. very exciting life. Working with people like uh, David Lindley, as he was, yes, Lord Snowden David, today, yeah. with fantastic colleagues like William Robinson, uh, opening up markets, doing events, uh, you know, going to Dubai with a team, setting up the auction room, selling the paintings, achieving record prices, as soon as it's over, going to Geneva for the jewelry sale. You know, it was a very, very dynamic and exciting life. But from curating show, writing essay, writing books, to selling... Well, I mean, most of these <laughs> academics, whom I know, they can't sell. You're pretty amazing, you know. You're all rounded. No, it was I the mean, it was the Kachi Gujarati trading genes, you know, that were revealing themselves. But uh, when I when I signed my agreement with Christie's, I made it I made a deal in my contract that I could continue to do museum exhibitions because the big Maharaja show I did at the VNA with Anna Jackson, were, uh, Jack Jackson was 2009, so it was after I joined Christie's. And I continued to participate in museum projects. And then, of course, with Sheikh Hamad, we did, um, while I was still at Christie's, exhibitions in the Met, in the V&A, in the Grand Palais, in the Palazzo Ducale in Venice. You know, these were all projects that happened while I was still wearing my Christie's hat. Uh, Christie's also allows you the chance to find objects and to research them. Every week in the sale rooms, there are new things that you learn about. And it allowed me to really broaden my, my, my depth of understanding. Because I joined mid-career, I had already uh, a big address book. And what I found uh, happening to me was that I was beginning to work with families. And the husband may be collecting Indian art, but the mm. wife likes uh, diamonds, and the son likes design, and the daughter's interested in 19th century painting. And it's this sort of scenario... And although you cannot be an expert in all of these things, you can begin to understand the market. Yes, absolutely. So you begin to see the market rise for Arab and Iranian art. You begin to see what's happening, you know, in the Indian art sales, which Indians in the world are buying the paintings, where are they being shipped, where... And so this was very fascinating from a market perspective. In between all of that, we had the economic crash, 2008. Uh, We had various things happening, Brexit, you know. So we, we saw big political shifts, but... It was a moment at which we saw definitely the rise of India. Absolutely. And working with uh, Christie's meant that I was part of a team that started auctions in India. 
Oh, do you uh, do you have auctions in India? We had Christie's auctions in Mumbai, so oh. we would show the paintings around India and around the world. Then we would fly them all to Mumbai. We would do events, uh, talks, lectures, dinners, and then we would have the auction. And um, you know, so this was very exciting to be part of. Of course, it is. That, it that, expe- that especially built this. especially you develop the market. That you, I was part of a group yeah. that developed the market with modern and contemporary Indian art, which was not normally my area of interest, but. Uh, but I learned about it and I enjoyed it a great deal. Uh, but after a few years at Christie's, to be honest, I was missing um, public art. Uh, I was missing the aspect of doing things for public good and for education. I mean, those exhibitions are very important because it is popular. It's not that it's just for the elite elite but people who's curious about civilization, about culture, they enjoy it. For me, I was maybe not ever intelligent enough to understand jargon and art historical jargon. I always disliked it. For me, quality writing is writing that is accessible to everybody and that mm. you don't need to be uh, formed in art history to read a uh, yeah. good explanation Agreed. of a painting. So that has always been uh, the backbone of the books that I've done. And I've always believed that um, the importance of a great work of art or the power of art or artistic movements is that it touches us on a human level. And the, the, we, we are all humans, we, we have the same emotions. We all feel uh, love, pain, jealousy, mm-hmm. anger, you know, joy. And um, so what uh, I try to do in, in the exhibitions that I've curated, it's continued with the Althani collection, is often to show the meeting of civilizations and the meeting of cultures. Now, the last, last question I want to, to ask you. Chinese, Indians, Arabs, I mean, what is the common what is the common thread? Do you think there's a common thread? Because we're all Asians, we know that we know that there's certain uh, 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 common points like like we have you know parents they don't want you to study art they want to create a legacy you know all these sort of things things so. Expert. Well, uh, <laughs> you know I'm an art historian and historian, and I was recently in Singapore. And if you go to the Asian Civilizations Museum, you see at the heart of the the, uh, museum a very interesting thing. It's an Arab-constructed boat that sinks off uh, the Malay Peninsula, and it's full of Chinese ceramics. Oh, I know that one, yes, yes. And it has examples of Chinese gold and silver, uh, let alone all the things that have disappeared, which must have been... Silks and cottons, etc., etc., etc. It's a boat of, I think, the 9th century. 19th century, yeah. And it shows the extent to which the Abbasid and the Tang empires communicated. The sophisticated objects that were made in one part of the world for the other. When we think of uh, the Islamic world, India and China, we, we think about these very sophisticated trade routes. We think of the silk route, but we think also of the maritime trade all around the Indian Ocean into the, um, into Southeast Asia, into the Pacific. The fact is that it's a part of the world that's geographically very tied one, uh, one region to the other. And I think that this is exemplified perhaps by the story of the Mongols, because the Mongols come out of Central Asia, but within a few generations, their descendants are the Yuan emperors, the Mughal emperors and Khans of, yeah, Khans. of of much of West Asia. And they have a common ethnic ethnic source, they have a common culture, they have a common civilization. It's 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 this this dialogue between East Asia, South Asia and West Asia is an ongoing one. And uh, But we, the trading is ongoing, so and so the knowledge and everything is ongoing is is exchanging. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and what is so fascinating is to see works of art that reflect very much the taste and the technology of these different regions that are in constant dialogue. We think a lot of blue and white porcelain. Mm. Of course, it's the cobalt that's coming from yes. the Islamic world yes. Yes. into yes. East Asia that makes possible this porcelain that is then shipped throughout the entire world. Actually, China, during the... Um, uh, during the Yuan din- uh, dynasty, the Mongolians, they have they have a lot of exchanges from Persia. Yes, you had huge exchange yeah. and you had very big 
communities. It's very interesting because uh, because of the visit to Singapore, I started to read a lot about the Tang Dynasty. The Tang Dynasty is the beginning, the 800. Yes. Yeah. And what's interesting is that in the Tang port towns, you had already very established communities of Indians, of Arabs, uh, and we have quite a lot of information about them and how they traded but and what they traded. But if you look at some porcelain, some of the patterns, those are Persian patterns. Absolutely. Yeah, th- and those the are the interesting. The fact is that in the 16th, well, you know, the 16th century, you start to have European forms yes. produced. Yes. But um, 16th, 17th, and 18th century, you see such a wide range of Islamic culture forms being made, not just in porcelain, but in Canton enamel, for example. And you need only to read the inventories of the Mughal court or to go to Topkapi today to see in Topkapi Palace all of the great collections of Saladin. Yeah, Saladin. All of the great collection of blue and white. And, you know, we know to what extent uh, Chinese porcelain was prized. In the Althani collection, we have an important dish which is called... Um, Bl- a blue and white or Saladin. Yeah, no, blue and white called the Mahin Banu dish because it has the inscription on the back of a Safavid princess and a Mughal mm-hmm. emperor. And it shows you how this dish, which is painted in blue and white with grapes, uh, hanging grape vines, mm. the extent to which these Chinese products were, were valued in different parts of the Islamic world. So I would say that, um, that you know, this ongoing dialogue over hundreds and hundreds of years really binds East Asia to South Asia and West Asia. So when you started with the Althani uh, collection, so... Did they give you a mission or you create the mission? Well, I I have to start a little bit from the beginning. Yeah. In 2006, I launched this book called Made for Maharajas. And Mm -hmm. on the cover Mm -hmm. of the book, I had a painting by Bhutte de Mauvel, a French painter, of the Maharaj of Indore. So he's a westernized Indian prince, uh, seated uh, in Indian style, wearing two magnificent diamonds called the Indore Pears. And the book launched everywhere. And just after I joined Christie's, I received from a colleague a message saying that there was a collector a gentleman from Qatar who wanted to to talk to me. And I spoke to this gentleman over the phone, and he said that he owned one of the paintings that related to the one on the cover of the book. (laughs) And could I I see him in in Doha? So I went to see him, and I discovered um, that uh, with this young collector that we had many, many interests in common in terms of avenues of collecting. In particular, at the time, he was very interested in 17th and 18th century France, which has always been a big passion of mine. So we uh, became acquainted. We gradually became friends. We got to know of each course, other. We of started course. to visit museums shared, together. Shared a common interest. And over time, I began to work with him professionally from a Christie's perspective. And of course, I'm speaking about His Highness Sheikh Hamad bin Abdul Al Thani. And over years, uh, I worked with him in many, many ways as a functionary. He's a man of great taste and vision. And I, I, I brought to the friendship or the relationship, professional relationship, my museum expertise. And uh, we started to do academic projects based on the collection that he formed. Mm. First with the Met and the V&A, and we produced books of his collection. So mm. I brought to that uh, relationship my love of because he uh, of Because writing. he won't understand or he won't even be aware that this, this can be put in a museum context. Well, I think as a great collector, he was acquiring works of art for his... For his own for him, love. For, him, for himself his and to satisfy his own passion and yeah. interests. And it was when museum directors and curators came to know him and came to see the quality of the collections that he understood that actually what he was collecting was museum worthy and should be in the public domain. And um, I think in the beginning, His Highness was quite modest and, um, you know, was, was, was perhaps... Uh, how can I say it, you know, to put yourself in the public domain in that way, you know, requires a certain state of mind. Of course. And I think that it it took him a little bit of consideration, but it was very because often... Because it's too high profile as well. Well, it means most that you're exposing that, yourself, yeah, you're putting yourself the, in the public domain. Yeah, exactly. But I think that once Sheikh Hamad's collection was more seen and known and people uh, began to comment on its importance and Sheikh Hamad began himself to realize that what he was assembling um, to satisfy himself, his own interests, was really a world-class collection that um, he began to feel that, indeed, you know, we should be showing these pieces in museums. Sometimes they were uh, short-term loans for exhibitions. Sometimes they were long-term loans. 
and sometimes they were entire exhibitions from the Altani collection. And when these exhibitions happened, I was the curator. And we reached a stage where Sheikh Hamad said to me, I mean, we're doing so many exhibitions now, I think you should really leave Christie's and come and work for me. And um, I was also, to be very honest, having a very hard time to stay abreast of doing three exhibitions a year or two exhibitions a year, as well as my Christie's job. And I was beginning to feel very, very stretched. I felt I was doing neither job as well as I would like to. So um, with that in mind, I left um, Christie's very happily. And we started to work on academic projects. And Sheikh Hamad said to me that, you know, after having shown the collection in so many places, what we really need is a permanent home. We need to have a space. Isn't it great? Because when he first collected, she, he's, he was a shopaholic. He has been a shopaholic. He didn't even think that he was going to have a, have a museum. When and it's just naturally it's, evolved. It, I think it was right? a natural progression. It's, it's, it's great. I think it's a, res, a result of the public interest in the collection that there was a feeling that we should have a space for this great collection. And we began to think about which cities would be the right cities. And we began to think about how we go about this idea of a public space and how do we, how do we work on this. And just by chance, around that time, in 2018, Sheikh Hamad received a letter from Prince Amin Aga Khan telling him about a great project in Paris to uh, bring back to life a building on the Place de la Concorde called the Hôtel de la Marine which was built uh, I know, in the I mid know. 18th century I know. as the royal uh, yeah. gar- gar- the garden yeah, of the la visit, it's where the yeah. kings of France kept their art collections and eventually after months of discussions uh, his highness reached an accord with the Centre des Mon- Monuments Nationaux which is an agency of the Ministry of Culture of France mm. to um, to show the collection in a 500 square meter space in the building and so this of course led to another phase of my life which was uh, when Sheikh Hamad said to me, you know, if we do this project, it means you must go to Paris and... And, and, and be there. <laughs> and, and be there. And uh, so it was a moment at which um, we began to think very, very seriously about what it is to make a new museum. And it's one thing to make a new museum in a fresh setting, yeah. uh, such as wonderful museums that, uh, you know, as, as they exist... Uh, but it's another project entirely to make a museum in, let's say, the most densely populated cultural zone in the world, opposite from the Musée des Arts Déco, yes. opposite from the Louvre, opposite from the Musée d'Orsay, uh, you know, 10 minutes from the Centre Pompidou, uh, five, 10 minute walk from the Grand Palais, uh, you know, with um, all, of these, all of these great institutions around us in a city which I would say is home to the most sophisticated uh, government-backed museum environment. Because one thing I understood both then and which I know now, having the pleasure of working uh, for some time in, in 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 this world, is the extent to which France as a government, as a state, backs and supports its cultural projects, the importance of the institutions, the cultural institutions, the museums, the projects, the exhibition program, and how these also reflect um, very important social movements, political movements. Of course, of course, that's what art is about. That's what it's about. And at the same time, uh, we have to remember that we were also entering a world where uh, there are many private uh, presences uh, whether it's the Fondation Vuitton, whether it was Mr. Pino's uh, mm-hmm. Bourse, whether it's the Fondation Cartier, you know, there are many also private enterprises that play a big role in culture in France. So um, this was, you know, a brave and very courageous undertaking to think that we could realize a new museum in the heart of Paris. But it's very successful. I mean, people, every time when anyone visited the El El Athani collection, they rave about it. I mean, I remember Scott calling me after visiting with you. What, how beautiful it is. It's so, what is, so what is your future plan for that? Well, I'll tell, I have to tell you a little bit about how the project came about. Yes, please, please. I would say that um, when I came to Paris, I was asked two questions consistently. 
uh, one question was, you know, do you really think Paris needs another museum? You know, don't we have enough museums? And then the second question is, what can you achieve in such a small space? Yeah, 500 square kind of meters is not small. big. Um, and, the, and the resulting project, which has been very successful, as you say, is very much the reflection of the vision of Sheikh Hamad, who, against all odds, when everybody was expecting that the space would be in a Louis XVI taste, because of its the Hotel de Marine, Sheikh Hamad understood that what we needed was a contemporary avant-garde architect scenographer. And he chose a young Japanese architect called Tsuyoshi Tane, who was proposed by Sugimoto, the artist, who is Japanese working in Paris. So he was able to bring the East and the West together. He also understood that what we must do is we must make a jewel box experience. Oh, uh, yes. So we that closed all the windows. We closed all the windows to control the light. And we studied very carefully the offering of the great national museums around us. Uh, when you go to the Louvre or you go to the Musée d'Orsay, etc., etc., what you see is works of art full of context. And what Sheikh Hamad understood is what we must do in the Althani collection is the opposite, which is to isolate and separate works of art so people can really immerse themselves into the physical properties of objects and to begin to develop connoisseurship. Yeah. Um, and he also felt that what would be exciting and interesting is for us to break some of the classic museum rules and to show works of art from different civilizations side by side. So this was a completely fresh approach because we were mixing, let's say, poor materials like terracotta next to rich materials like lapis. We were mixing, you know, ancient Africa with ancient China, with ancient Egypt. And so, this is the interesting part. So it was very fascinating yeah. because it, it made for visually very thrilling experience. And it's like a cultural dialogue yes. between And it was curated so that there were con various conversations in each of the galleries, various themes. And the public responded very, very, very well and very positively to this. In addition to which, we started to develop an exhibition program. And we have uh, two exhibitions every year. The exhibitions always have a very strong message. We always show superlative works of art. The visit is normally 30 minutes or so, 40 minutes or so. But the idea is that you immerse yourself completely in the aesthetics of a different civilization or the aesthetics of a different world. Mm -hmm. I think that's very, very important, that it's not just to come and look at beautiful things, but to look at these beautiful things, understanding that they can teach us something new or they will allow us to look at the world in a different way. What is it? Is the Altani collection going to have an, to build another outpost or increase the area? I think um, uh, at this point, yeah. you know, as I, we're very much the collection is is completely a reflection of the vision of Sheikh Hamad and his his plan and his mission. I would say that the plan uh, for present is really to perfect the offering in Paris mm. before doing anything else. The most important thing is to consolidate and to grow our public to make sure that we're delivering high quality exhibitions consistently and that we make our place in what is the most visited city in the world, where we have a very privileged location in the center yes. of the city, yes, working is. with an agency of the Ministry of Culture of France. Uh, we are involved in lending constantly. Yes, of and course. And we are involved in, in sending our exhibitions abroad to other institutions. For example, uh, to lead on to another subject, uh, I am uh, appointed as uh, presently appointed as artistic director of the forthcoming Islamic Art yes, Biennale Islamic Biennial. in 2025. And I can't tell you too much about it uh, in terms of the next edition and what we'll have, but I can, I can tell you a Is summary. Is this going, going to be in Riyadh? No, in, the Islamic Art Biennale takes place in Jeddah in, a, in, very, Jeddah. in a very special location. It takes place in the Hajj Terminal Complex, which was built by the Americans in the 70s. It's um, a wonderful tented ground with permanent buildings, which was designed to accommodate the millions of pilgrims who come to Jeddah in oh, order to go to Mecca and Medina. Yeah. And when I was a small boy, I remember reading about this complex in National Geographic magazine. And little did I know that one day I would be making a project there with my colleagues. But the idea of the Biennale is very revolutionary. It's very interesting. It's to show historic Islamic works of art 
with contemporary commissions and contemporary projects in dialogue. Wow, that's very... So we will take themes that come out of Islamic culture, Islamic ritual, prayer and belief, and to put them side by side with contemporary commissions by artists from around the world. Change. Congratulations, that's so, such a great thing. Well, I'm, I'm really happy to work in the project with uh, a really superlative team in an extraordinary uh, setting. When is it in 205? So we'll open at the end of January 25. So I hope you'll come. Wow, very soon. It's around the corner. Wow, around the corner, really around the corner. So now we're working intensively on the graphics, on the catalogue. on a How exciting. And, uh, and the thing that's very exciting is the number of visitors. Last year, I think the Biennale received more than 600,000 visitors. So it receives wow. a very big public. And I would say a large number of those visitors are not necessarily uh, normal or, you know, repeat Biennale visitors. They're often uh, pilgrims. They're people who live in Jeddah. They're people who live in the region who come to see the spectacle to, to understand uh, something new. And so it's a very important public. How wonderful. You know, Thank you so much, Elmi. So, thank you. Thank you. And then I think this is a great session and people knows more about Asia and knows more about what, what you have been contributing. <laughs> thank you very much. You're really thank you, generous. Elmi. Thank you. Thank you.